Welcome back to the second lecture for week three. We remain focused on the meaning of the preamble and its place in the Indian constitution. This second lecture is broken up into three parts. I begin with part two, which is about key political ideas behind the Indian state or the Indian polity, namely that it is sovereign, democratic, and a republic and that it is socialist and secular. The last two qualifiers were added subsequent to the original constitution and we need to spend some more time to understand why that happened. In part three, I will focus on uh, issues relating to the core values or goals that the constitution, constitutional preamble aims for. In part 4, I will focus on how the preamble may be interpreted both politically as well as legally. So let's get started with part 2. We had noticed when we read the preamble in full that it describes the Indian state to be sovereign, democratic, republic, as well as being socialist and secular. Let us turn to each of these uh, in individually. We must remember that the, the uh, preamble to the constitution of India proclaiming sovereignty is against the backdrop of having endured British colonialism for over uh, nearly 200 years. In 1858, Queen Victoria was proclaimed as the Empress of India and you will notice in the uh, in in the um, image attached that that proclamation was read out in Delhi to a, a, a large group of uh, Indian princes and nobles who were present there. In 1961, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru invited the Queen to visit. So Queen Elizabeth II visited India as the Queen but not as the monarch of India. And this shift, this shift from 1858 to 200 years later, 1961, is, is broken and importantly by the constitution of India in 1950. That is what changed uh, the, the, the historical nature of the Indian polity. So uh, uh, a gap of uh, almost 100 years. You will remember that India is remains a part of the Commonwealth. So the Commonwealth is an, is, is an agglomeration of previously British colonial states which are brought together in a common uh, international forum, international association, which, uh, which has Britain as a member and its previous uh, uh, and Britain as member and previous colonial master. This transition between India becoming a sovereign republic and yet being part of the commonwealth was a delicate one navigated quite carefully in the Indian constitutional debates, assembly debates, as well as the constitution of India. We had noted earlier that as early as the Karachi resolution in 1931, India had proclaimed a sovereign power, not the Dominion Republic, uh, not a, 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 you know some in some other kind of treaty arrangement with uh, Britain, but but as a sovereign country. And this proclamation of sovereignty was uh, sharp and clear, and and became a precursor to what what was done in many um, in many. Uh, post-colonial states subsequent. So, what does sovereignty mean? Sovereignty, at the very, uh, in, in a very simple sense, means that India, it, that Indian political authority would rest ultimately in the President of India and Parliament, which is which serves at, at the Union government level as the core repository state power. Sovereignty also means 
that we no longer remain subject to control, political control, military control, economic control, or interference by any other state or external power. This is also seen as a key feature of a republican form of government, a government that is not subject to a monarch. So a republican form of government would emphasize that government here is created at the will of the people. It is government constituted by common people on the basis of, in, in India's case, because we are a democracy, universal adult franchise, and the purpose of government is to serve the people. The presence of an elected head of state in the prime minister, as opposed uh, to a, an indirectly elected president as the head of state, as opposed to a uh, hereditary monarch, makes clear that the Indian Republic is distinct from a monarchical form of government. The choice of these three relatively independent political values was critical to the form of government that India chose, sovereign and independent from its colonial masters, democratic and elected on universal adult franchise, and a republic with no monarch and an elected head of state, which formed government for the people. These choices may have and often get portrayed in a, a standard civics textbook as being foregone conclusions. But when India achieved independence, these were all seen to be significant and, um, and, and marked a clear departure from the political regime that pre-existed us in 1947. There has been much recent work on the first elections of India, uh, you, you find a, a screen grab of S.Y. Qureshi, who was the election commissioner, uh, writing about the first Indian election, as also uh, Ornit Shani's work on early, uh, the early elections in 1951, general election, which gives you a sense of the novelty and the effort that it took to, to actually create and sustain a viable democracy in this country. The preamble also proclaims India to be a socialist country. And this, this insertion into the constitution requires some careful thinking through and understanding. First and foremost, that Professor K.T. Shah had proposed an amendment to the preamble to in include secular, federal, and socialist as key values describing the Indian polity in, in, the, um, in, the, in the Constitution. And Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, as the chairperson, the chairman of the drafting committee, as well as a key constitutional framework, uh, opposed this inclusion. But the reasons for his opposition need careful attention. First, he noted that proclaiming India to be a socialist democracy might prevent future electorates in, in framing the social and economic policy of the state. So he suggested that the freedom to choose the goals of the constitution and the purposes of the state must be left to future democratic electors. However, he quickly qualified that by noting that the directive principles of state, state policy, part four of the constitution, that we will turn to in a few weeks' time, already give the, the Indian state a core socialistic orientation, that there was no need, given the principles of state policy outlined in part four of the constitution, to, to state the value of socialism in the preamble. One must remember at that time that the Indian constitution was being forged in the, in the early years of the Cold War. A Soviet Russia was pushing for socialist states across Asia and parts of Eastern Europe, while America and the Allies 
were looking for states not to turn to socialist. And so socialism and socialistic states were an uh, important bogey in international political affairs. It was, a, one must understand these debates in the 1950s against these backgrounds. As it turns out, while Dr. B. R. Ambedkar defeated Professor K. T. Shah's amendment, at least two of those phrases, secular and socialist, came to be included into the constitution um, in 1976 through the 42nd Constitution Amendment Act. The Constitution 42nd Amendment Act was introduced around the time of the political emergency, constitutional emergency, proclaimed by the Indira Gandhi government and was, was uh, preceded by the Swaran Singh Committee's recommendations to emphasize that directive principles should have some precedence over fundamental rights and to ensure that parliamentary supremacy over the judiciary was maintained and one prevented the judicial challenges to economic and social welfare legislation uh, that this in inclusion of socialists in the constitutional preamble was essential to send a signal to the judiciary and to, to the interpretation of the constitution. Now, it is important that when we use the word socialism in, in, um, in the preamble, that we understand that there are many shades of that, of socialism, many forms of political socialism and meaning. And, and the meaning that we attach to this, to this uh, term must be historically specific to India's uh, experience with claims of socialism. Now, for Nehru, he was clear that the socialism that India needed was of a Fabian sort, not a revolutionary socialism. So, a democratic and incrementalist progressive politics that, that ultimately realized a socialistic state, not a revolutionary uh, Stalinist or, or communist uh, socialism. This was clear in the early preferences and expressions of the Indian freedom movement. So whatever else socialism means, uh, it is that form of socialism that the constitutional framers seem to have embraced. This is, uh, this is captured quite uh, carefully in a speech that Dr. B. R. Ambedkar made on the 15th of November in the Constitutional Assembly debates. He says, what should be the policy of the state, how the society should be organized in its social and economic side are matters which must be decided by the people themselves according to time and circumstance. It cannot be laid down in the constitution itself because that is destroying democracy altogether. This, this quotation is not a quotation about the introduction of the word socialist in the preamble, but one more broadly about how a constitution, while choosing core, econ core economic and social values, must not foreclose the possibility that future democracies need to make choices on these questions, significant choices on these questions. It should be left to them to decide the nature of the policies as well as the nature of a state institutional design necessary to achieve these social goals. So while constitutions must provide a political society with a future sense of direction, the constitution must not foreclose uh, all options for a future democracy. So much for the word socialist in the preamble. How should we understand uh, the second word? And, uh, and, 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 and on this slide, I just have a quick grab of the Constitution of India preamble as it stood in 1950. And notice that it misses the words socialist and secular and only includes a sovereign democratic republic. The rest of the preamble deserves attention and we will talk about it. Uh, but this, 
we we will turn next to the to the to the insertion of the word secular in the preamble. Um, and uh, the the Sunday Standard covered the Swaran Singh panel's uh, motivation to introduce socialism in in the constitution. And uh, this, for those of us who are very familiar with that period of political history, was also a time when the Indira Gandhi government sought to nationalize several areas of industry. You know, when we pay attention to the history of, of state design, one recognizes, as uh, the recent work by Thomas Piketty, Capital, suggests that states had two choices. They either had the ability to effectively collect taxes across the range uh, of people and generate uh, social equality in that form, or some states, including France at various points, chose to curtail the rights of shareholders and own the, the, uh, the industries themselves. As we know, in the 1970s, India went down that path, uh, and, and, and this discussion by the Swaran Singh panel and the insertion of socialism into the preamble is reflective of that process. The preamble also introduced, the, uh, the, the word secular was also introduced into the preamble by the Constitution 42nd Amendment Act. Now, the introduction of the word secularism into the preamble is uh, less studied and less worked out. And let me just share a few broad outlines of, of how one might think about this, this uh, insertion. First, it is clear that the, uh, the idea that India would be a secular and not a theocratic state is found very early in the Indian freedom movement. In fact, it is a, it is a key point of distinction between the demands of the Indian freedom movement and the Muslim League. The Muslim League pressed uh, religious identity as the basis of political identification and the, in, in, the Indian Congress refuted that as the basis of political citizenship and identification. In the objectives resolution, this became all the more clear because Nehru made it absolutely clear that, that the Indian state would protect the liberty and freedom of thought, faith, and worship. So, their discussions in the Constituent Assembly make it clear that India would be a secular state. The debates were only about the nature and shape of that secularism and the scope and extent of its application. That is where the debate was. The debate was not on the fundamental value of Indian secularism. For, for, for those who are very familiar with Indian constitutional arrangements, you will know that Indian secularism was distinct. It was not a, a, a secularism borrowed in full either from the United Kingdom or from the, the US or from some other country around the world. We evolved a, 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 a distinctive form of secularism where the state was not entirely disconnected from religion but played a neutral role. That kind of secularism was the, the insertion of secularism into the preamble in 1976 must be understood as an insertion or a confirmation of that, that distinctive kind of Indian secularism. I will now turn from the from a description of the polity, the key values of the polity, to, a, to an inquiry into the key goals or purposes of the constitution. Broadly put, these goals and purposes may be described in four parts, justice, liberty, equality, and fraternity. And these four parts, uh, four goals of the constitution were described in further greater detail 
and 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 bear some exploration and explanation the pursuit of justice was multi layer the kinds of justice the constitution commits ourselves uh, the, the indian society indian polity to is justice social economic and political so social justice is broadly the pursuit of a form of fair and equal treatment that would ensure that no uh, circumstances of birth and no forms of social organization should deprive any indian citizens of opportunity and and the benefits of a free republic clearly caste was was the primary group around which uh, a mobilization had occurred in the constituent assembly uh, dr b r ambedkar represented this position as did others and his work on the annihilation of caste gives us a fair idea of the nature of social justice claims that were uh, that were embedded in the constitution to be clear gender and religion also played a part in discussions on social justice um, and in, in in constitution making and any interpretation of the constitution must have these uh, these core goals in mind uh, when when we discuss the contours of social justice the constitution also commits us to a form of economic justice contemporary discussions on economic justice focus on the problem of inequality inequality in income inequality in asset ownership and inequality in the benefits of a uh, of a uh, growing and developing society now while the while in the united states in recent years united states and europe this has come to be seen as the problem of the 1% the indian constitution in the directive principles doesn't shape the, in, the the problem of economic justice as just being a problem of you know extreme inequality it sees the problem as being a problem of equitable distribution uh, both of the means of production and the benefits of of economic production so uh, the, the the model of economic justice embraced by the indian constitution is a, a a structural one as opposed to a purely individual focused model of economic justice political justice is the ability to ensure that all members of a political society have an equal right to participate in the political system now we generally recognize political uh, justice to mean that every person has an equal vote we discussed this in an earlier lecture and article 325 makes it clear that there can be no discri discrimination among those who vote in a general constituency for uh, their leaders and the this is a remarkable uh, political revolution that occurred in the period 47 to 50 and thereafter where india adopted universal adult suffrage even though it was a poor illiterate and underdeveloped economic system political justice can have other uh, um, other meanings and other uh, other consequences uh, in india for example we adopt a form of reservation of seats for the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes to ensure that some discrete and insular minorities find political representation through a through reservation system um political justice could have further meaning and extensions in our contemporary moment uh but for the moment uh uh we might understand this multi dimensional form of justice that is captured in our preamble social economic 
and political. The second value that the Constitution commits us to is the value of liberty. The value of liberty is, and I just for the ease of convenience and, and explanation, break it up into two parts. A liberty of thought, expression, and belief. The, the placing of the liberty of thought, expression, and belief right in the first page of the Constitution, the preamble, confirms that India adopts a liberal political model where individuals have freedoms of thought, expression, and belief. No authoritarian state, not a communist state, not an authoritarian state of any other kind, but a liberal political society that allows for, uh, for, uh, for actors to, to, uh, to express themselves and, and to have thoughts and beliefs that might be unique to them uh, or uh, particular to their social circumstances. We must notice that the scope of liberty includes both the internal thoughts and beliefs, things we hold close to ourselves that we may or may not share with the world at large or with anyone at all, as well as the ability to express them in words and content. Both dimensions of thought, expression and belief are protected. The second liberty that the preamble assures us of is the liberty of faith and worship. We had a few minutes ago spoken about how the Indian, the Indian constitution and the new Indian state was forged on a commitment to the secular principle. This secular principle finds expression right in the, in the preamble with the confirmation that we all have the liberty of faith and worship. In the Indian constitutional uh, making process as well as the freedom movement, the rejection of a theocratic religious state like Pakistan was a very clear commitment in the Indian freedom movement to divorce the salience of religion in political life. By including both faith and worship, once again the preamble anticipates that both the inner elements of belief and faith as well as its external practice elements, uh, whether they be uh, ritualistic or otherwise, are within the scope of protection and liberty of the new Indian state. The third value that I will turn to is the equality of status and of opportunity. Now, readers of the Indian constitution know that we have an elaborate equality provisions. Article 14 um, it instantiates a general principle of the equality before law and the equal protection of laws. 15 talks about uh, uh, an anti-discrimination principle on the basis of religion, race, caste, sex, or race, but we will spend a little bit of time on these and discuss some of these cases later in this course. But at the moment, you can understand broadly that Article 39 uh, ensures that we have we have an equal right to adequate livelihood uh, and 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 equal pay for equal work and other kinds of economic equality. But these uh, this entire charter of equality provisions is captured in the preamble through a very short phrase of equality of status and of opportunity. Now, how, how might we distinguish between the two equalities, an equality of status and of opportunity? In a medieval uh, and feudalistic and casteist society, distinctions of status and colonial society, distinctions of status uh, were endemic. Uh, there were all kinds of distinction, uh, distinctions of status that ensured that certain groups and certain individuals were placed in perpetually inferior positions either by birth or by the nature of the relationships they had in society. The constitution makes a clear departure 
from those pre-existing social uh, and legal and political arrangements and confirms that all of us are, have the equality of states. It also confirms that no matter what our place and, and station of birth, that all of us are guaranteed an equality of opportunity. An equality of opportunity to do what is not spelled out in the preamble, but it makes clear, the preamble makes clear that equality of opportunity, which is that no opportunities must be foreclosed to particular individuals for any um, irrelevant reason. This critical commitment finds its way in our preamble. Ambedkar talks about why in, in the brief quote uh, in, in the text box, which, I, which I'd like to read, talks about the relationship between equality and liberty and the next value that we will discuss, fraternity. He, he, and I, l let me read that, that short excerpt. We must make our political democracy a social democracy as well. What does social democracy mean? It means a way of life which recognizes liberty, equality, and fraternity as the principles of life. These principles are not to be treated as separate terms, but in a trinity. Ambedkar's confirmation of the interrelatedness of these social values is critical for us to better understand the ways in which we must read the, the various components of the preamble. Let us close out with an understanding of fraternity, which is a, a slightly more complicated and maybe more difficult value to understand uh, before we look at the interrelationship between these values. The Constitution confirms that we have fraternity, and I read from the Constitution, assuring the dignity of the individual and the, the uh, by further amendment was inserted the phrase and the unity and integrity of the nation. Now what is striking about the value of fraternity is that it doesn't find a sharp mention in the debate on the objectives resolution. Uh, Nehru piloted the objectives resolution. Uh, and Ambedkar's emphasis on the value of fraternity comes at a late, much later uh, part of the debates on the making of the Constitution. So one must turn to Ambedkar to better appreciate the place of fraternity in the Indian uh, preamble and in the Indian constitutional framework. I quote, fraternity means a sense of common brotherhood of all Indians Indians are, are one people. It is the principle which gives unity and solidarity to social life. J.B. Kriplani, in a slightly different debate, added a different texture to the value of fraternity. He observes, fraternity is allied to democracy. It is a moral principle to be lived in life. This insertion of the fraternity value into the preamble calls for some calls for a better understanding of what fraternity means and its relationship with the other values in the constitution. Fraternity is often presented as if it were a social principle, a social principle of common dining, common marriage, uh, and other forms of social interaction that allows for a community to come into existence, a breaking of primordial forms of community and the creation of a modern form of community, one that is built on the principles of equal citizenship and of equal moral value. Is this a social principle, meaning that it has only a social practice or is this a political principle that must find its way in the way we design political institutions or in the way that uh, courts interpret the constitution? Arguably, it is both. 
uh, and we get some clue of this uh, conclusion from the text of the preamble itself. The text goes something like this, and I, I'll paraphrase and read. It secure to all its citizens, the preamble tells us, justice, liberty, equality, and to promote among them all fraternity. Now you might say them all is a reference to the citizens or to the values of justice, liberty and equality. So fraternity appears as if it was a cross-cutting value, a value that infuses meaning to justice, liberty and equality and, and uh, one that must be a common practice of all citizens. In the quotation in the text box, which I read out on the previous slide, uh, Ambedkar seems to suggest as much. And we might do well to, to understand fraternity as this kind of cross-cutting principle that the Constitution commits us to, at once, to a social and to a political principle. So much for the goals of the Constitution. In the next part, I will turn to how we might interpret the preamble. In particular, we, we want to understand what its political meaning might be and what its legal meaning might be. And these might, these might intersect, but not always. So, we had, in, at the start of this lecture, uh, in week three, paid some attention to how we, the people of India, in our constituent assembly, have, have given ourselves a constitution. The language of the preamble clearly emphasizes the special representative claim of the constituent assembly. The constituent assembly, through its deliberative and consultative processes, speaks for we, the people of India. So what do we, the people of India, do in the preamble? We adopt, enact, and give unto ourselves this constitution. Now, an ordinary legislation, an ordinary statute, would only say that a statute is enacted by a particular parliament. That is the normal or a particular legislature of the state. The state, the, the legislature of the state of Karnataka hereby enacts a particular law. What is clear by the preamble to the constitution is that the meaning of adopt, enact, and give unto ourselves makes it clear that the constitution is different from all ordinary statutes. A constitution, it suggests, is adopted by the people, adopted and for the people, because we give it unto ourselves, a form of political bootstrapping. There's no one else, no British parliament to give us this constitution, no other authority. So the people adopt and give unto themselves a constitution, the rules of the game that they will follow in their future democratic life. This conclusive affirmation that the authority for the constitution is the people themselves is a form of political a discourse and a form of political framing that emerged with the U.S. Constitution and one that the Indian Constitution framers completely uh, adopted. This, for further understanding of what this kind of popular affirmation of a constitution might mean, one must turn to the U.S. debates and I would encourage many of you to who are very interested in this part of our political history to do so. How does the preamble travel in the courts? The first and important idea that we must understand is that the preamble is not directly enforceable. So no citizen of India may find themselves in a court and say, I seek social justice and here is what I think social justice means. Now give it to me. This kind of a legal action 
the legal enforcement of the preamble is not anticipated in the constitution and not uh, not applied so the first point about legal meaning that we must appreciate is that the preamble is not directly enforceable but enforceability or the bar on enforceability should not be taken to meet to 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 lead us to the conclusion that the preamble has no legal effect because the preamble as the early part of the constitution can have significant interpretive effects in an early case the berubari union case in the 1960s the supreme court clarified that the preamble cannot dislodge the ordinary an unambiguous language of the articles of the constitution so you cannot say uh, and cannot plead before a court that why why can't you simply give me social justice here no matter no matter what the other provisions of the constitution say or what other ordinary statutes say just you know give me unambiguous social justice and the the supreme court or the high courts will not engage in such a thing however the preamble serves as an interpretive guide in several other ways it communicates to future interpreters as the minerva mills uh, case in the 1980s confirms that future interpreters would do well to recognize the preamble as a repository of some of the core values of the constitution so in so far as ambiguity arises in the interpretation of the text of the constitution and and courts are placed in a condition of doubt trying to figure out whether they should take x or y approach uh, the preamble is is a critical clue that must guide Uh, future interpreters of the constitution so the preamble uh, we know and we, we need to have no doubt that our constitution is committed to a form of social justice a deep and enduring form and hence future interpreters while while interpreting statutes and uh, constitutional texts would do well to remember this and incorporate this critical perspective into their constitutional interpretation So I try to conclude this section on the legal meaning legal and political meaning of preamble in the courts by clarifying that while the political meaning of the preamble is rising significantly with a uh, constant public invocation pledges of reading reading the preamble in public spaces uh a uh, uh, act that would gladden the hearts of constitutional law teachers and constitutional law enthusiasts around the, around the country to uh, to its rather modest legal meaning not one that will displace uh, the 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 legal the strict legal construction of the articles of the constitution but one that supplements it in significant and important ways so let's close with that this week we we've covered a broad introduction to the preamble and i trust that in through these two lectures you have come to appreciate the place of the preamble in the constitution of india in new and refreshing ways thank you and see you next week